welcome everyone. Um, I think we'll wait a few more minutes to get started. Well, not a few, a couple more minutes to see if some more people show up. Uh, in the meantime, you can think about submitting an abstract to the Fluxnet meeting this summer in beautiful Bruno, Czechia. Abstracts are due by the end of the month. It's sure to be a good time. Okay, seems like people are rolling in, so we'll slowly get started. Um, I'm Jake Nelson, uh, I'm a researcher at the Max Planck Institute, and I'll be moderating the session. Um, uh, we're really excited to have uh, Simon Besnard and Sophia Walter here to tell us a bit about Fluxnet EO. Uh, before they start, I'm going to plug again the Fluxnet meeting this summer. Uh, we're going to have, the plan is to have Fluxnet meetings every year for the next three years, once in Europe, once in Australia, and once in the US. So this year is the, the one in Europe. It's the first one in like 10 years. Really exciting. Um, abstracts are due May 31st, and the um, registration will open soon once we finalize the all the costs and everything, but the costs will be quite reasonable, I think. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing. And as Sophia pulls up her screen, uh, I will say Sophia Walter is a researcher at the Max Planck Institute as well. Uh, and Simon Besnard is a researcher at the Heimholz uh, Center Potsdam, the GFZ. And they're gonna to talk to us about Fluxnet EO, which is a really nice, exciting new data set. It's open for use. You can download it at the Carbon Portal today if you want to, um, but they're gonna tell you much more about it. So take it away, Sophia. Yeah. Hi everyone. And thanks Jake for, for the introduction. Yeah, so today, is about remote sensing and remote sensing accompanying eddy covariance uh, measurements to aid the interpretation of the flux measurements and also to uh, help model development and model benchmarking. And what we're going to introduce today is what we call the FluxNet EO datasets. Um, we have published together with uh, many nice people here uh, a paper about a year ago together with the first version of the data set. And now since two or three weeks, uh, the second version of it is online. And um, Fluxnet EO is what we think an analysis ready data set. It's one of several uh, that offers to uh, be used in conjunction with the site level data, as I said, for, for interpretation and model development. In Fluxnet EO, we focus on um, observations from the so-called MODIS sensor and the um, Landsat satellites. And what is this? Um, so, okay, I forgot that slide, sorry. <laughs> so there's uh, first an overview of uh, for which sites actually it is available. It's uh, more than 600 sites that we have processed in the second version now. Uh, in the first version, there was 300 something sites. Um, 
and it's uh, a combination of several um, ICOS uh, releases, the Warm Winter and uh, the Drought 2018 release. It's uh, Ameriflux releases, it's the Fluxnet 15 dataset and uh, sites in the Latui dataset. And um, now just a brief introduction about um, the two uh, sensors that we are using. So one, as I said, is the MODIS. Uh, MODIS stands for Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectrometer. It's um, mounted on two satellites. One is the Terra satellite, which was uh, launched in the year 2000. And it observes in um, the morning at 10.30 and also in the evening, plus minus about one to two hours local time. And then there's a second satellite with the same instrument, uh, which was launched two years later. And this uh, satellite passes over um, about uh, the mid, mid of the day and also shortly after midnight. And um, what we have in Fluxnet EO is uh, both uh, surface reflectance. This has a spatial resolution of 500 meters and also land surface temperature. And this is a bit coarser at about one kilometer resolution. Uh, but both of them sampled every day. And about Landsat. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. I will uh, talk briefly about Landsat. Um, uh, so it's basically like one of the uh, longest satellite we have uh, observing the Earth. I think Landsat 1 was launched in 1972. And uh, since then, there is basically like a family of, of, of different sensors that um, uh, were put in orbit. So we had Landsat 1 in 1972, uh, and then we have Landsat 4 and 5, uh, Landsat 7 that came in in 1999. Uh, Landsat 8 was uh, launched in 2013, um, and recently, uh, like NASA launched Landsat 9 in 2021. So uh, this is a bit like the... Uh, for like Landsat is working, they basically have different uh, Landsat sensors that uh, came um, since 1972. Um, like compared to uh, to MODI, so one of the main advantage of it is like actually uh, special resolution. So we are like, uh, if we look at MODI, we have uh, like 500 meter resolution, but Landsat actually has uh, like 30 meter resolution for most of the bands. Um, like the drawback of Landsat compared to, uh, to MODIS is we have uh, like a 16 days uh, temporal resolution. Uh, if we look at the spectral resolution, so we basically uh, can go from visible infrared on, on Terma wavelength, which is, uh, which is actually nice, uh, but which is uh, actually nice currently, but we have uh, on orbit like Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. Uh, so it means like uh, we can actually have more or less a temporal resolution of like eight days because the two sensors are like looking at the earth um, uh, currently. Um, so um, again, so what we do for this like sensor, we actually like collect uh, surface reflectances and also like some kind of quality uh, assessment band where we uh, where we try to uh, remove uh, any like bad quality pixels related to, uh, to cloud or cloud shadow. And uh, this is what we try to take care of on this present year before we do any um, any analysis. Um, yeah. That's it, I think, for this slide. Thanks, Sophia. Okay. So then we thought we are, it would be good to introduce the the processing steps that uh, we have developed and apply in the both to Landsat and Flexnet EO a bit more in detail. Uh, and for this, uh, I'm showing you here an example time series for the enhanced vegetation index. This is a greenness index for uh, Hütjela in Finland, and it represents an area uh, of within one kilometer radius around uh, the station. And it's uh, basically averaged all pixels that are within this uh, radius. Um, yeah, what you see is, um, uh, an annual cycle uh, since the early 2000s from MODIS and you see data gaps in winter when there are no data available and you also see some suspicious values at some points in time. So what we do first is a quality check as uh, Simon mentioned and in the case of MODIS this uses um, flags that come with the MODIS products. Um, 
for those of you who are familiar with them, it's the uh, MCD 43A2 products. And we use them to get information on which pixels are actually only on land to get out any water contaminated pixels. Um, we remove any um, time steps that um, have snow and uh, then check for which uh, time steps actually the um, BRDF inversion has good quality. So the inversion to basically calculate the surface reflectance. And the green dots here now is what is left afterwards. And then we also apply uh, an empirical outlier filter, which moves in temporal windows over the time series and removes any data point that has a large deviation from the time steps around it. And um, yeah, you see quite a lot gets removed from these um, quality filters. And what we then do uh, is gap filling. So now you see again, the dark green dots are the good quality original data points and the light green ones is what has been gap filled in a series of uh, steps. So those steps are moving, um, moving medians in, in windows um, and scalings of mean seasonal cycles or filling in of the mean seasonal cycles themselves under certain conditions, snow covered times are filled by a constant value in winter where you can see this here, for example. Um, although this is um, often pretty challenging because the snow flag, so the snow information that comes with the modus data is not really reliable always. And um, we have tried now in the second version to work on this, to improve it. Um, and we think we have improved, but it's still not perfect. Um, but it's already something that we can achieve with um, without resorting to any other auxiliary data sets, because this was one prerequisite that we set ourselves. We want to have this gap filling operation only work in time and not in time and space or only space. And we do not want to resort to any additional data sets. Um, the idea behind this was to have it as generic as possible. So to have this um, both the quality filter and also the gap filling applicable globally and also to um, data sets with different characteristics by just adjusting, for example, window sizes. And um, yeah, so the end result basically then looks like this. Um, the green one is then the clean time series and compared to the red ones, the, the original ones. Um, okay, and I thought we could also take a look at um, the land surface temperature as another example. Um, what you see here is the noontime land surface temperature in uh, Las Majadas, a site in Spain. It's again uh, averaged all pixels um, in one kilometer around the tower, and it's the raw time series. And again, you see a nice uh, seasonal cycle. You see it starts only later here in 2003 because uh, it's mounted on the Aqua satellite, which was launched later. And you can also see that, um, yeah, there are some individual um, suspicious data points which may be contaminated by residual cloud effects, for example, but that otherwise, in terms of day-to-day -day variability, um, the it's higher than, than for the EVI, which is also a bit more challenging in terms of the processing. And um, so for quality filtering, we apply again an outlier filter. And in this case, it's uh, just comparing to the mean seasonal cycle across um, the largest part of the time series and removes any data points that have a suspiciously large deviation from, from the mean seasonal cycle. And then what is then left is again gap filled and the gap filling steps here are also a series of different steps as generic as possible. And again, not resorting to any other auxiliary data sets except for um, the other uh, LST modus observations. So we have four of them a day. So two from Terra and two from Aqua. And we use them uh, to fill one another by the, th by the three others if they are available for a given day. 
And those is again, this is again a series of moving windows and scaled mean seasonal cycles to the observations. And um, yeah, so the end result then looks like this. And you see that also here, for example, in the first two years, we only fill in the mean seasonal cycle itself. <clears throat> and this is then again an example of what the end result looks like. And now we thought um, it would be good to show you how the data is organized. As Jake mentioned earlier, they are um, available on the Carbon portal. And we have prepared a short notebook and we can delve into it a bit. Uh, do you see it well? Yes. Good, okay. So, this is a, a nice uh, functionality at the uh, ICOS Carbon portal. And um, it's the FluxNet EO data is organized there in two collections, one for the Landsat and one for the MODIS. And uh, there are some functions with which we can get first an, an overview of how they are organized. And you can see this here. So this is uh, lists all the zip archives in which a number of sites are always um, summarized or put together. So, and in sites belonging to different um, regions, because we thought it would make sense if people are only interested in sites from a certain region that they do not have to download the whole archive, but maybe just from that specific region. Um, yeah, you can see there's one um, for Africa. There is uh, a number of uh, archives for, for the Americas, uh, for uh, the Asian sites. And um, sometimes if there are many sites available, like for example, for, for Italy or for Germany, then they also got an, an own zip archive. And um, it, they are consistent between the Landsat and the MODIS, so for MODIS, you see the same collections. And then we can delve into the um, <laughs> into the collections. So what, what is in inside one of them? And then you see a large list of uh, files. And you see that for, for each side, you have two files. One is uh, an average cutout and one is called something with subpixel. And the, those are two versions, which we thought might maybe be useful for different use cases. So average cutout uh, contains average uh, time series of different variables within one kilometer radius of the site, uh, like the example time series that I've just shown you. And the subpixel uh, file contains uh, spatially resolved uh, cutout data in four by four kilometers around the site. So there's a number of pixels depending on the resolution, and each of them has received the quality filter and the gap filling, and so that you could also use them for any spatial analysis around those sites. Um, yeah, and then you see many more, and each of them for these two versions. And we thought we could just give a brief overview um, of what is in there. So maybe some, I, I have predefined something here, but we can ch easily change it. So are there any wishes of whether we should look at MODIS or Landsat? If somebody has a wish, then please just speak up and tell me, or a specific site. If there are no special interests, then I go with what is here. Good. Sorry. Okay, I just go. <laughs> so then let's look at this uh, US site for, for MODIS. There's a functionality that um, uh, basically extracts the files for this site from MODIS from the zip uh, archive. This is, ay, ay, ay. That 
is not good. It used to. Let's try another one. Okay, I swear it used to work on Friday. <laughs> then I'm sorry for that. Then um, maybe we can make it work later. Then I just would say we skip that and go back to more some illustration examples of what they might be useful for. Simon? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know what went wrong. I mean, we can also like use the there is this folder like with the example data, right? I think we can use uh, in the in the notebook. I think there are some NCDF files saved there, right? If you open this one, yeah, you can play with the, those one, right? So if you uh, yeah, but yes, it is here. Oh. Yeah, so you can actually like run uh, the. Uh, line where you said test underscore data. And I think that should work with uh, at least US. Yeah. If you go, yeah, this. If you run this one, that should work. Yeah. So you can actually like play with them now. So it's just the. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So now but what have we loaded now actually we have loaded the sub pixel data from neustift okay so you can see it has dimensions of uh, lat pixel and long pixel those are the pixels in the cutout and we have uh, more than 800 uh, 8000 time steps between 2000 and 2022 and the pixels um, you can see here they are counted from zero, which is the center pixel, which is the center, the, the pixel that contains the given tower. Uh, and then in north, south, and east, west direction from, from minus to plus, counting the pixels outwards. And then you see here a number of data variables um, contained in this data set, which is um, the different, the first seven bands of modus. Uh, the, in, the surface reflectance from those first seven bands uh, in the red, in the near, in the blue and green. Uh, and for each band, you have an auxiliary flag, which gives the gap fill type. And this is uh, a flag. It's described here uh, with which gap filling step each uh, time step has been filled, if it has been filled. And so it would be good to use this also in any analysis uh, in order to get an idea of how reliable certain data samples are or not. The most reliable should obviously be the ones that have not been gap filled at all. And then there are a number of uh, vegetation indices. So here's the normalized different water index with different reference bands. We have the enhanced vegetation index, the normalized difference vegetation index, the near infrared reflectance of vegetation, the kernel NDVI, and the wide range uh, vegetation index. Um, we have uh, also an auxiliary field describing the distance from the tower for the reflectance data. This is why it has this 500 meter uh, name, uh, uh, add on here in, in the name, because it's different from what needs to be applied for the land surface temperature data. So they are coarser, as I mentioned earlier, they are, have uh, one kilometer resolution. And there's a second field here, distance from the tower and 1000 meters. So this goes together with the land surface temperature. And then we also have uh, four land surface temperature data sets for the two satellites and the day and the night overpasses, which you see here. And for each of them, 
also again the the gap fill information for them and now comes something that i haven't mentioned earlier is that also the land surface temperature comes with a geometrical correction because um depending on under which viewing angle you look at the surface and at what time you will have pretty different temperatures depending on how the shadow uh, shadows are cast on re relative positions of the sun and the satellite and so and modus has a pretty large variability of its viewing geometry and um, this is why there have been methods uh, developed in an attempt to correct for such effects and we have applied them uh, and give additional fields um, of the land surface temperature as an estimate as if it was observed from directly above the tower. This is here with the uh, indicated with VZA, viewing standard angle of zero degrees, also again for uh, all four of them. And we also decided to give uh, a second one with an oblique view on the side, which may also be useful for some applications. And uh, so this would be then an estimate of the land surface temperature under a viewing angle of uh, 40 degrees. Yeah, okay. And so now you have an idea of the type of um, data variables in such a file. I will then show you once more the average cutout file because there are some more. Then we take another side. It's just to show you the variables. Okay, and you see here are not 60, but 108 variables. And also only the time dimension, no space dimension anymore, because this is now the average version of the data sets and here you have in addition to the variable itself and the gap fill type information two more data fields which is uh, the number of good quality observations per time step that go into this spatial average and the standard deviation across these good quality ones also as just to give an idea of how reliable these observations may be and again, it's the same variables as before, the different, um, the surface reflectance in the different bands, the vegetation indices, and also the land surface temperature. Okay, so now we can go and explore a bit the variables. Um, we can use the, the red reflectance, for example, or yeah, let's use that one. We saw the EVI also uh, earlier and then uh, you see what the time series look like again for the whole uh, modus uh, era. And then if we look like but what is left, if we only look at the original, uh, if we use the, the gap fill type information to only use the good quality data sets, you see uh, that it's easy to apply and probably useful for most applications. Okay. And then we can try the same. I think you can, Sophia, sorry, can you replace a source with a sensor in the uh, like here? No, in the function, like source equal sensor. No, if you go down, sorry. Go down, yeah. In the function, there is source equal, put like sensor equal. Okay, never mind. Okay, we can have a look later. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Then we stop here. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. 
my turn to take uh, take it over now. Uh, we just wanted to uh, uh, to talk briefly about the um, like the importance of like looking at um, at flux footprint when we actually use this remote sensing uh, data set. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of uh, a paper from uh, Ozen Shu that was published in, in 2021, uh, where you actually like look at uh, different flux uh, to our site, I think only in the US, uh, where you look like actually like the temporal dynamic uh, of the um, footprint of the uh, of the fluxes and actually like show like how it, it, it changes uh, over time. So I think you looked at monthly uh, footprints on actually like investigate like different sites on actually like, again, like show like how how it changes over time. Um, and what's uh, what actually show on this paper, it was whether like one take a fixed extent uh, targeted area across sites or not, so that you can have some like biases in the, when you when we do like model data integration. So this is where it might become like relevant where we actually like play with remote sensing data to uh, don't take, for instance, an average of, of uh, one kilometer cutout, but uh, actually like start to integrate um, the flux footprint to actually uh, actually like capture like remote sensing data that actually like match properly um, like the CO2 of all of fluxes. Uh, I mean, I can give you an example of how this can look like. So if you go down, Sophia, on the next slide, um, so I can like give you a, a rough idea of how it could make actually like sense to um, uh, to extract the uh, the flux footprint. So here uh, we have actually like two sites. So the top row is actually um, Las Maras. So again, one of the uh, sites that Sofia was uh, showing earlier. Um, so on this plot, so what you can see, uh, we actually like compare uh, like the monthly time series of AVI versus the monthly time series of, of GPP. Um, so if, if you actually have a very blue color, it, it means that the two signals have a very high correlation. And if you have uh, like a red color, it actually means um, like the two signals are uh, anti-correlated. Um, so, and if we look like especially how this correlation look like, for instance, for Las Maradas, so like, within this one kilometer cutout. So it looks like most of the landscape is actually like quite correlated with, a, um, so EVI is actually like quite correlated with uh, the signal of GPP, but there are also some uh, some places. So actually, if you look at the north part of the of the cutout, which is like has this uh, strong red color, uh, we, we see some, uh, some anti-correlation. Um, this is like present in both Landsat and Modis. So, um, the left on the right uh, top plot. Uh, so that kind of like indicates, so like when we actually like integrate like remote sensing data, so maybe one don't want to actually like use these uh, these pixels where uh, where like GPP on EVI are actually like anti-correlated. Um, so uh, this is where like, it might be like interesting or important actually to account for this, uh, for the uh, footprint of the fluxes. Uh, we can look at, uh, Another side, which is uh, on the bottom part, it's a site in Germany. Um, I think it's a crop site, if I recall correctly. Um, and if we uh, do again, this like the similar exercise where we compare the signal of EVI versus the signal of GPP, uh, here we can see like, yeah, most of the cutout is actually like has a positive correlation with, uh, with GPP on EVI. Uh, so maybe like in this kind of like landscape, um, like taking account for this, uh, the footprint of the flux is, is maybe like less relevant than for uh, for us like Las Maradas. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, to flag on to like mention uh, like the potential importance of actually like taking a, a account this um, the uh, the footprint of the fluxes when we actually integrate. Uh, remote sensing data into uh, uh, into analysis that uh, uses like fluxes. Um, yeah, thanks. You can go on, Sophia. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention something about the relevance of uh, higher spatial resolution because um, we've been always asked, uh, why do you have these two sensors, Landsat and Modis? Um, we always like try to justify uh, like the use of, of these two sensors um, 
because on the one hand we have modis which has uh, a, a daily temporal resolution which is actually like relevant where we want to like capture signals related to drought for instance that we cannot capture with landsat which has 16 days or even sometimes like monthly um like good quality data uh on the other hand so we have landsat because we have a 30 meter resolution product uh versus Modis, which has a uh, 500 meter resolution product. Um, so in this plot, so I just wanted to really spread a bit like uh, what Landsat can bring uh, when it comes to, for instance, uh, disturbance dynamics. So here we just pick a site um, in the US uh, that actually like experienced a fire uh, in 2002, I think if I recall correctly, or 2003. And here we're looking at, uh, at the EVI anomalies. So basically like the, the difference between an EVI image versus the long-term mean of this uh, of the EVI time series. Um, what you can see on the left side, so we have this uh, Landsat product um, where we can see in 2002, you have this like red color happening. So it means like you have quite a drop in EVI and we tend to see the same signal in, in the MODIS product. Uh, so like the two break actually like um like show like similar dynamic uh, in space and time but what it's actually interesting to look when we look uh, when you use landsat actually it's like the more detail we have in the in the landscape so we can actually like capture a bit more uh landscape future compared to uh compared to modus um so i think it's actually like a relevant product to use when we actually like for instance look at distance dynamics uh to really like capture uh, such a detail that occur at very small scale compared to, um, uh, yeah. So I think that was uh, it for this slide. So Sophia, I think you can go to the next one. Um, yeah, so should I take this one too, Sophia, I guess? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we also wanted to um, to mention other products. Uh, so we have FluxNet EO dataset, which is, uh, as Sophia mentioned, like an analyze ready dataset. Um, but there are also like different products that one can use. Um, there is a very good one that uh, that NASA actually like put together. So it's called the the fixed side side subset tool, where you can actually like add this map, and then uh, you have uh, actually quite a lot of sites, way more than, than what we have. Um, so I, I don't know if you can click on one of them, Sophia. If you click at the red dot, the uh, green dot, sorry. I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. So this is, for instance, uh, one site. And if you go down, Sophia, you can actually like see a list um, of the different products that they, they provide. Um, so again, it's it's quite broad. I mean, it's it's only for Modis, uh, but you can actually have access to a lot of products. Uh, okay, it's not only for Modis anymore. Okay, cool. And then, uh, but the main like limitation or drawback compared to uh compared to the flocknet eo there is no uh let's say like gap filling or like post processing so uh you can easily access the data i mean i think you can download the data via uh csg files um and then actually like access the data but then when it comes to post processing so uh everything that sophia was mentioning so uh removing the cloud removing the the, the water pixel uh doing some outlier processing and then doing the gap filling uh this you basically will have to do it uh, on your own but again i mean i think it's a great tool uh i think we've been using in the past um but again it's uh the responsibility of the user to actually like, do any kind of like post processing um yeah can you go down to the and, next yeah sorry yeah and just to add and in, in terms of um Product selection, it's complementary actually because um, the FluxNet EO is based on the so called MCD 43A4 and A2 products, which are daily uh, for the surface reflectance. And you see it's not here in the list. So those are other products. And the same for the land surface temperature. It has uh, eight daily land surface temperature, and uh, FluxNet EO contains daily ones. So this is also something to consider depending on the question at hand. Okay, next one. Yeah, I think you can probably go down with the arrow, yeah. Perfect. Um, 
Another one that we wanted to show is actually um, uh, not a modis based product, but a, a Landsat based product, uh, which was developed by one of our colleagues uh, from the University of Valencia, um, Alvaro Moreno. Um, so it's actually uh, like a product that's um, gap fill Landsat uh, surface reflectances. Um, I think the data is only available for the US, I mean, CONUS, and uh, recently Europe, uh, I think. Um, so it's, it's a completely like different algorithm than what we use uh, because they kind of like fuse Landsat and MODI sensor to actually like perform a gap filling. Uh, I mean, I don't want to like enter into detail, but it's basically uh, based on, on, on the bias aware uh, Bayesian data assimilation again by using Landsat and and, and Molly's product, uh, where they actually uh, like gap fill Landsat time series. So I think like uh, if you look on the bottom uh, left plot, so this is more or less how it looks like for one year. Um, so we have uh, this kind of like yearly temporal profile uh, for one specific location. So uh, I mean I think so far you can click on different location if you want to to see how the signal changes. Um, but it's actually uh, like a very nice product too that you can uh, you can use. Uh, they also use uh, the Landsat collection too, but I think they only cover the year 2009 till 2021, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, and we, Within the FluxNet EO data set. So we actually like start in, um, in 1990 till uh, 2022. 20, uh, so we actually have a longer, longer time series. Um, and then, so if you go down, Sophia, so we are actually like interested in, uh, in, do, in doing some cross consistency check between the two products. So we actually like uh, look at uh, the side that we have in. Where we have data and where like uh, like the proof from Alvaro has data, and trying to see whether or not they are like they are like quite similar. Um, so uh, so this way you can see on this on the three plots that we put on this slide. Um, so if you look at the top left plot, so it's basically on the on the x axis we have uh, near infrared coming from a uh, FluxNet EO, and on the y axis you have the near infrared coming from the uh, from the proof from uh, Alvaro Moreno. So you can see like the uh, like overall they tend to uh, to uh, to have very good agreement, uh, but then when we look a bit more into detail, so for instance on the top right plot, so what you can actually like see is like when they tend to uh, to disagree the most is like when you have uh, the winter times, and, and this is like very likely due to the difficulties of any like gap filling method to actually like gap fill signals where we have a lot of snow. Uh, a lot of missing data because this is where actually like uh, if we if you recall like one of Sophia's plots uh, where we basically don't have uh, good observations or like no observation at all. So this is where like gap filling net, uh, techniques need to most of the time interpolate or guess more or less what, what what should be the value. And this is like somewhat like reflected when we compare um, like two independent products, uh, because if we look at, for instance, of the green season, so they tend to agree uh, nicely these two products, but then they're like, again, diverge quite a lot when we uh, when we look at the winter month. Um, and this is also like reflected in the bottom left plot. So when we actually like compare uh, like the correlation between uh, the two products on the y-axis versus the fraction of gaps for like uh, one specific time series. Uh, and what you, what you can see is actually like you tend to see uh, to have like a, like a negative correlation. So the more gaps you have on your time series, basically like the lower um, the correlation is between the two, uh, the two products. Uh, so there seems to be some kind of correlation between how much data we have per time series versus how much these two products um, agree between each other. Um, that was it for uh, this slide, so yeah. Yeah, and um, for the last part of the talk, we thought um, it might not be harmful to show a few applications where the Flux NISIO data are used or have been used. Um, and I'll start with one, which is um, Flux upscaling. There are different initiatives 
worldwide, globally, and also regional, uh, regionally specific upscaling exercises to get uh, regional flux estimates. One of them is um, Fluxcom and the new Fluxcom X. And uh, here at the Institute in Jena, we are using a version of the Fluxnet EO to uh, drive uh, the, yeah, to train <laughs> the, the machine learning and to um, then do also both side level flux predictions and also uh, global predictions. And we also apply the, the same or almost the same, let's say 95 uh, consistent uh, processing to the side level data and to the global uh, data so that both for the training and the predictions, we have uh, consistently processed remote sensing data. And um, we have also, used um, adaptations of the, the gap filling approaches um, to apply them to other similar remote sensing data sets uh, like vegetation optical depth or sun induced uh, chlorophyll fluorescence from different sensors um, or also the lens surface temperature and uh, vegetation indices from the sentinel 3 sensor so it's um just to say that the method itself is um adaptable to the characteristics of other remote sensing um, data sets by adjusting temporal windows, for example, and different uh, function parameters in there. And yeah. Next one is Simon. Yes, uh, back to me again. Um, yes, so uh, there are also like another application, which uh, it's basically around um, light use efficiency model so it's at least was actually one of the first uh use case of or like fluxnet EO data sets uh it's basically a former colleague of us from mpi uh shanning bao and uh she basically wanted to integrate the fluxnet EO data into uh into a light use efficiency model uh for estimating gbp so she, the way she does it she basically like try different um model structure on trying to to find like the uh, like the best model structure to actually opt, um, estimate gpp uh and the way she used uh our products in our paper so uh she basically need to represent um FAPAR in the different uh ue models she uses and then she basically like, need to have a proxy for for FAPAR and she actually used uh the ndvi times you we provided in, in, in the first net eo data set uh into our uh modeling framework so it was really like using our like flux net eo data set as a forcing uh for process-based model um yeah okay and and the last one is um an example of two two sites here in, in uh, europe uh, looking at drought legacy effects again by a colleague, uh, Xin Zhu, and he uh, used an earlier version of the EVI of the Fluxnet EO data to describe uh, morphological changes in the vegetation and then uh, to describe what would be expected in a in a model that has no legacy effects and then comparing to what was actually observed to uh, understand a bit more in detail what is the carryover effects of the um, big uh, droughts and heat waves that have occurred in Europe. Okay, so how to access the data we mentioned earlier, they are uh, available at the carbon portal and here there go big, big thanks to uh, Ute and uh, Zeus. They have been super, super helpful uh, in, in yeah, making this a nice product and putting it together and, and publishing it. And um, so big credits also go to them. And there's um, the, the modus collection that you can find with, with a description. And then if you scroll down, you see all the different collections for the different regions of the earth. And the same for Landsat, looks the same. And then if uh, you click on one of them, you'll get uh, an in theory, you'll get an overview of uh, exactly here. You get a map with the sites uh, available. And then, go back here. 
And then there is a, a readme that also that comes with the second version of the data that describes the main characteristics and the main changes compared to version one, which is described in the paper that we've shown earlier. And then we also want to mention a, an R package that has been developed in Switzerland, in, Ber in Bern, um, to access the data basically easily from R. Uh, and so far, if I understood correctly, it's uh, targeting version one, but I don't think it would be hard to adapt it to version two. And um, yeah, with this, thanks a lot for, for being here, uh, for your interest. Uh, if you come to use the data, feedback is always very, very welcome uh, of what is strange, what is good, uh, what would be good to have, what would be needed. And um, yeah, thanks again to all of you and to our uh, co-authors as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Sophia and Simone, for this really nice, broad, in-depth overview of this new data set and how we can use it and, and how it compares to other things. I think it was really nice. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to anyone if, if you have questions or feedback or comments. Um, feel free to raise your hand or drop it into the chat. I think we have some minutes now to just have a nice discussion. Um, so feel free, don't be shy, raise your hand. Um, go ahead, Deep. Uh, hi, Sophie, this is Deep. Uh, am I audible? Hey. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Well, uh, is it possible uh, to use the same pipeline uh, for uh, data sets, uh, the same MODIS data sets like uh, FFR or LAI to uh, replicate the same thing? Yes, in, in theory it is. It would just be a matter of making sense of it by uh, adapting the, the function parameters. It's mostly window sizes and uh, deciding of whether really each of the series of the different steps makes sense to be applied to this other data set as well or not. And I guess uh, also the, the quality checks, they would need to be, they, I think they would uh, de, uh, def, defer more strongly between the different products. Yep, thank you. Oops. We have a question in the chat from Hao Shen. Uh, I'll just read it real quick. Thank you for the nice talk. My question is for a specific variable, which time series is suggested to be used, i.e. the average one or a subpixel, for example, as a predictor in a machine learning model for predictions? That depends on how sophisticated you, you wanna go. So. In theory, what would be optimal would be to know the, the flux footprint for the sites that you would use and then to try to match this as best as you can with the satellite data. And here, uh, again, Landsat would, would be more easy uh, spatially, but then it depends on what temporal resolution you, you train and you predict. So if, if monthly is enough, then for sure go with Landsat. But if you uh, work at finer temporal resolution, you would have to go with, uh, with the modus data. And then you could use the subpixel one uh, version to work with the, to match it with the footprints. But uh, as those footprints are mostly not available and not so easy to obtain, um, you could also try to work um, with the average one. Um, I, I would say this is a, a bit of a very discutable question. So in Fluxcom, for example, we use an, an average time series at the moment, which uses a, a different number of pixels for, for each site. And it's um, the reason for that is basically to enhance uh, data availability of, of the good quality data. And so to have less reliance on 
the gap filling actually. So our main, uh, how do you say this? Our, our main interest was to have uh, as reliable data as possible, given that we do not uh, at the moment take into account uh, the flux tower footprint directly. Um, I would say it really depends on your um, preferences and uh, there's no no golden rule how to approach it and I actually would be curious to see a systematic comparison of uh, what the effects are if there are any systematic effects then in in the performance of the models if you use different versions of it. No concrete answer. I'm sorry, but <laughs> as I said, I, I'm not aware of any golden rule. It's the art of machine learning, right? Uh, Martin Dekauer has a question. I can read it. I don't know, Martin, if you want to read it yourself. I mean, maybe I can take this one. Uh... Yeah. So, I mean, I can read it out loud. So, like, Martin was asking whether or not there is a a Python version similar to the R package. Uh, so like the notebook that uh, Sophia showed, which actually I just fixed it now, there was a little bug in the function. So we can look at uh, more size now if you want to. Uh, I mean, we can easily like uh, make it available uh, and you can access the data if you want to. I think the only thing you're gonna have to do um, it's basically create an account on the ICOS data portal uh, to basically like access the data. But otherwise, uh, I think you can just send an email to me or to Sophia, and then we're happy to share this uh, notebook with a function uh, with it that actually like extract the data uh, that you need to uh, access to actually. Martin says he'll send you an email. Um, there's another question from Jiang Gong Liu. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Is there any special care uh, taken for wetland sites? No. Um, the The idea was to have this approach as generic as as generalized as possible. So it's it's applied to all sites independently of what kind of sites they are. Um, the only exceptions is um, we check whether snow occurs in general at a site or not. And then the processing dif differs a bit uh, in order to account for mostly interannual variability and to not destroy it basically by, by filtering out some uh, natural or some real peaks, uh, which then by the algorithm might be uh, taken as uh, as artifacts. And um, it it's true, it might be good to uh, have um, ecosystem specific processing that is true for wetlands, that is also true for um, tropical sites. But um, no, we haven't done that. Any further questions or requests? There were requests earlier for a couple of sites, but um, I don't know if those people are still around. Um, hi. Yeah. yeah, I had uh, I had uh, just suggested the uh, Zanico site uh, for Modis, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter if now it's too late. It's, it's fine. <laughs> to try for the notebook, you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's for oh. earlier, so it's not. Yeah, we can we can play. Right? Simon, you you said you fixed it, right? Then we could try. Then I stopped. No, I say, I, I actually not. I don't know. There is some. Uh, maybe you can. <laughs> Try Sophia, like somehow I got like permission denied from the um, 
from the data portal. So I don't know. Uh, maybe you can know, Sophia. Uh, I fixed the bug in the in the function. There, there was something weird. But no, I just have permission denied to access to the data. So I'm not sure why. Uh, but maybe you try it twice, Sophia. Maybe it works for you. Okay, then I just, just uh, restart the kernel on them. And... Yeah. Always the. It takes real bravery to do a live presentation because it always seems to go wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it was working nicely oh, last no. last week, and then somehow I don't know. <laughs> this is always the beauty with a live demo, you know. <laughs> We can always add something to the YouTube recording where you show it's working. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, editing. Uh, what, what was Zanico? What was the code? Um, Z R K Z R K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That looks good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And which variable would you like to see? Uh, the EVI, I would say. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, that cool. would be an example. Yeah. That is a modus, right? That is modus, yeah. Modus, yeah. Okay. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, okay. I guess. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. You, you don't get better feedback than perfect. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can look at Landsat if you want to, like how, how they differ. Uh, just to, uh, that would be nice. I just didn't want to take your time, but that would be nice, actually. Because I have... can actually. Yeah. Okay. Now I can see them together. Maybe we can. Just select the later part. Okay. Just as so. Mm. So the orange one is Landsat and the blue one is Morris. Okay. The orange is Landsat. Mm. Yeah, so I, I think this is like a typical example where uh, we still have to improve some part of the processing. I mean, you can see, for instance, for Landsat, you we still have some outliers in the in the winter mount that are not being picked up by the uh, by the outlier algorithm, right? So you can see this, like, yeah. for instance, I think 2003 mm -hmm. is like little, I mean, just one point, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. so we just a little pick that. Uh, that actually, like, we didn't pick up in this method. But uh, yeah, so this uh, mm -hmm. this is yeah. some issue. Like, I mean, it's again, as Sophia mentioned, we are trying to have like this very generic uh, method that works across all sites. But sometimes it just uh, it's very hard to be uh, to have a generic technique. But uh, yeah, so sort like. Of. Okay. It's cool. Not, Perfect. Yeah. We can discuss that maybe later. Yeah. Like often. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. So unless there's another urgent question or request, uh, I'd like to thank Simone and Sophia again. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm sure they're happy to follow up by email. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Great. Uh, then thanks everyone who, who joined and is still sticking around for the discussion.
um we'll see you sometime soon maybe at the maybe the flexnet meeting in july